Good evening, everybody. I'd like to call the meeting to order. Can we rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Can I have an approval of the agenda, please? So moved. Support. Any discussion, additions, deletions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Next on the agenda is student council. We have Seraphim. Welcome. Second time I get to see you today. <laughs> All right. Well, our main updates this week is just about Charity Week because that's going on this week. Um, first off, we'd like to say thank you to all our, our sponsors. We raised $4,300 through them, so a bunch of local people and, and um, community businesses that supported us. And so their banner is hung up outside the cafeteria in the high school, and there'll be stuff going out about them as well to, for their businesses. Um, today we had Penny Wars, a volleyball tournament, and Pi a Teacher, and that brought us our total to about $6,000. So we're on our way towards our goal of $10,000. Um, unfortunately, we did have to cancel some events because of lack of participation, like the Parents' Night Out that was scheduled for Friday, and our um, pep rally that we were trying to have on Monday. But we're trying to get momentum with some new things, so hopefully in the future years we'll be able to get those going. So we are still $4,000 short, but we're confident we can get that going. So we're encouraging everyone to bring their $10 in tomorrow for our snack break and $5 for our therapy dogs, which is going on tomorrow. So if anyone's in the high school that's interested in that, they should definitely participate. That's all. <laughs> What's Thanks. your charity? What ch oh, the two charities we're supporting this year are Feeding Detroit and Down River and Mimi's Mission. Good for you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Next on the agenda, we have uh, presentations. We have a DCTC um, Health and Education Occupation Program. Uh, Brett? So at the high school, we have um, a great opportunity for our students with, uh, in conjunction with nine other districts, we um, offer a ton of different career pathway programs for our students. And we're very fortunate to have the health science program and the education program at our high school. And we have um, students and staff who are here to present today. So we have um, Mia, Abby, Ms. Gray, Dr. Gazzardo, Ms. Metzger, Jacques, and Isabella here to share about our program. So if you can welcome them. No, no. All right, so I'm Mrs. Gray, um, and they introduced Stacy and Rachel. Um, basically, what CT is, it's career and technical education. It used to be called vocational a long time ago, um, and a lot of people called it vacational because they thought it was a real easy class to go into and skip out on others. Um, but the CTE program does provide students with hands-on training that can be applied in all kinds of different careers, um, not just the ones that we do here, but in other programs. 95.8% um, uh, four-year graduation rate for Michigan students completing a career tech ed program, um, and that's statewide. Um, in our program, I just got the statistics on that, and 100% of the students that have gone through our class have graduated. And then there's some myths about CTE. The first one is that um, it's a vocational tech education, which is no longer the case. Um, it's not helpful for necessary, or not helpful, helpful or necessary for college-bound students. All of our students are college-bound. Um, in the education department, they do need a four-year degree after they get out of high school in order to work as a teacher. Um, and the same thing in the health science classes, they also need to go on for education. And then the last myth, um, CTE will leave me unprepared for college. We are preparing them for college. Some of the work that we are doing in our classes is college level work. So, um, Stacy Metzger, I'm here on behalf of the Health Science Program. Um, it's two years. Tech, 
typically it's two years. We are having some new opportunities for sophomores within our program, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But um, we give students the opportunity to gain foundational information in healthcare. They get hands-on skills. They learn CPR. They learn um, health information. They learn anatomy and physiology. Um, they focus on assessment of patients, the disease process that patients go through. We do um, <clears throat> some opportunities where students replicate disease states where they're like in a virtual dementia tour they get to know what it feels like to be a dementia patient and how that may impact their um, care that they provide for patients um, so they are very much prepared for their secondary career we offer some opportunities for articulated credit with some of our local community <laughs> colleges where they get um, credit in language of medicine or medical terminology. They get to work directly with patients in entry level positions upon graduation with some of the industry recognized credentials we offer. Um, I have been a respiratory therapist and still am working at Corwell Health, which is formerly BOMA. I work at Corwell Health in Dearborn. Actually, I worked last night from 6 to 10 p.m. So I still do that every single week of my life. So I have real life experience that I can offer to the students. So I am very passionate about healthcare and about educating future <laughs> healthcare professionals. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, I'm Rachel Gazzardo. I am a physical therapist. This is my second year at the high school. Um, this is my 10th year in healthcare, and also really feel that it's important that these students in career tech get a solid foundation so that when they go on, I, I tell them all the time, learn from my mistakes. I didn't have any of this when I was in high school. I didn't get half of what they get until I was about three or four years into my undergraduate degree and then even more into my PT career. So um, I really want them to learn at least enough to make college and that college transition easy for them. Um, so I like to integrate, and Stacy does too, we like to integrate our stories and our experience as healthcare workers into our classroom as much as we can. Um, I want to share with you our educational pathways. As Stacy mentioned, we are trying to pull in a little bit of opportunity more for uh, sophomores than we previously had. So um, our first class is that Intro to Health Sciences course that is taught at Grosse High School. You could take that course potentially as a 10th or 11th grader. After that, you would progress to one of four options, pharmacy tech, nursing, allied health, sports medicine, or a class at Henry Ford Wyandotte that is um, very heavily clinically based. The nursing and allied health and sports medicine courses are also both taught at Grosiel High School. Um, I'm teaching sports medicine, and Mrs. Metzger is teaching uh, nursing and allied health. Starting this program as a sophomore allows you to take your second year course as a junior. What that then does is opens up your opportunity as a senior for either work-based learning or a second HS2 Health Science 2 course. So that additional HS2 course could be beneficial. Let's say you know you wanna work in um, allied health, but you're not exactly sure. Maybe you wanna do that nursing and allied health course your sophomore, or excuse me, your junior year, senior year, head to Henry Ford Wyandotte, you're gonna get a CMA um, certificate at the end of that potentially, as long as you pass. Um, the other option, which is really great, that we're really starting to get into this year is the work-based learning option. Um, so let's say you have the opportunity to work as a PT tech in a rehab clinic, something like that, right? You get your credit as a student for that. You also have the potential to get paid. You're getting clinical contact hours. You're getting those patient, high quality patient contact hours that employers are looking for. Right? You've got a leg up on the other students who are applying for whatever program you're going to go into. So we really think that's a valuable option. Um, and so we're trying to allow some sophomores the opportunity to do that. So our Health Science One program starts with a basis in anatomy and physiology. The students learn vital signs. They practice on each other. Then they go um, practice at um, Atria Kinghaven on King Road at an assisted living facility on real life patients. We teach them infection control so that we main, make sure that they're safe at all times, hand hygiene, isolation, and um, just masks, keeping them safe. They learn how to communicate. They learn how to build their resume, how to be employable. employable. We take them on 
um, job interviews. We bring in guest speakers to talk about their career paths. We go to Corwell Health, and um, the students have the opportunity to shadow a couple of different departments, respiratory, lab, imaging, radiology, OR, cath lab. What am I missing? I can't remember. I'm probably missing one. Um, we go they to, go to a lot of they go to a lot of different <laughs> places in the hospital. We, like I said, go to King Haven. So we offer a lot of opportunity for the students. <clears throat> The second year that's based at Groziel, which I teach the nursing and allied health, um, the students graduate as certified patient care techs, which op offers them opportunities to work um, entry level nursing aid positions within our direct community. They know how to do EKGs, they get phlebotomy skills, they get personal care skills. We have EKG machines, we have hospital beds, we have all sorts of cool things in our room that we love to offer to our students. They do clinical rotations at Corwell and critical care, at Vibra long term acute care and lots of different um, experiences that they get in that second year of our program. In the sports medicine program, one of the things that I um, like to drive home for them is that with sports medicine, you are more than likely, if you continue in a path of sports medicine, you're going to be in a leadership role in the sense of you're going to be the one assessing the patient, you're going to be the one making the clinical care plan and deciding what happens with that patient from there. And so I really like them to be comfortable with each other in a patient-clinician relationship. Um, and so we practice that very early on in the year and continue with honing our um, clinical decision-making skills just so that they are not quite so nervous when they actually get to college and have to start um, doing some of those similar steps, uh, clinical assessment, things like that. So they start off with a deep dive into musculoskeletal anatomy and then continue to practice their examination and assessment skills all year long. Uh, we get into injury management. We're currently doing emergency response. Um, they will eventually get into strength and conditioning, therapeutic rehab, so that by the end of it, um, they hopefully will feel very comfortable applying for a role um, straight out of high school as, say, a rehab tech and feel even more comfortable in a classroom setting to further their education in sports medicine, rehab sciences, any of the pre-medical um, or pre-health uh, career pathways. Um, as far as their work-based learning opportunities, uh, this year we did just start a new uh, partnership with Henry Ford Wyandotte Outpatient Rehab. So um, we had the established Corwell Health relationship. Now we've added in Henry Ford. So in terms of our big downriver healthcare systems, they have an established relationship uh, at both. Um, they will also have the opportunity to shadow their local high school athletic trainers and um, they do have the opportunity and full support to go and uh, do some job shadowing in additional six hours of whatever career path they feel most passionate about. So I don't want to just limit them into that, pigeonhole them into that uh, sports medicine field. They get to explore a little bit more beyond that too. Um, coming out of their program, we do try to provide industry recognized uh, credentials such as that patient care tech certification. Um, but they also do get the OSHA 10 healthcare certificate, BLS, Stop the Bleed, and uh, the health science, the sports med science students get the CDC Heads Up Concussion Management certification as well. Oh, this is one of our favorite parts of our whole program is our student leadership organization that we support and we encourage our students to participate in. I could not be more proud of the students that are in HOSA and the, the things that they do. Honestly, it's just amazing to watch them participate. So HOSA is a student leadership organization where students get to compete against other high school students in health career events. They compete in sports medicine as athletic trainers. They have a skill list. They have to perform skills. They have to take a test. They have to learn how to, like there's nursing assistants. They're learning how to take vital signs. They're learning how to make beds properly. They're competing against their peers in nursing, injecting um, vaccines and doing intramuscular injections. And I'm proud to say of our 50 students, we are taking 26 students to states in Traverse City this year. So more than half. So we're very proud of them. We hope that we're going to internationals in Dallas. And with that kind of piece of ending HOSA and how important student leadership is to us, we would like to introduce you to our students. Jacques Gores and Isabella Davis and they're Davidson and they're going to give us a little bit of information about how they felt as students in our program. Welcome. Thank you. So before I start, I'd just like to thank Ms. Metzger and Dr. Gazzardo for choosing me and Isabella to speak here before you guys today, but I'm just going to get started. 
So hi, my name is Jacques Gores and I'm a senior here at Grosio High School. I am a second year student in the Health Occupations course. To say that Health Occupations has prepared me to begin my college education and career in my chosen profession of nursing would be a glaring understatement. The knowledge and textbook information provided to me through the course of my two years has already proven to be valuable in application of skills required to work in the healthcare industry. I've not only learned the information, but I've also physically and clinically applied it through clinical rotations, job shadowing, and community events. It's allowed me to begin networking within a large industry that has a vast amount of career opportunities. This course has set me up for success in the way of being exposed to the industry, the skills, and the baseline knowledge that many students entering the healthcare field would not, leave, would not have until they are, are in their third year of college. My exposure this early on will give me a large advantage when applying to and entering the actual nursing program at Nova Southeastern University, which is a small private institution, and it is highly competitive. Aside from the knowledge and skills required to be a nurse or healthcare professional in general, I've also been mentored and guided in healthcare leadership, research, and career progression. In addition to the courses themselves, the opportunity to participate and be a part of Health Occupation Students of America provided me with once-in-a-lifetime experiences. <coughs> I was able to attend HOSA's regionals two years in a row, and next month I will attend HOSA's state competition for my second year. At these competitions, I'm able to meet the other students aspiring to be in the healthcare industry from the entire state share information and experiences with them, as well as learn from their perspective and innovative ideas. My instructors, Dr. Gazzardo and Ms. Metzger, have and share an invaluable wealth of real-world experiences, ways to apply the knowledge I have and, benefits, and the benefits and value of a variety of healthcare professions in addition to nursing. I grew up the child of a nurse, which also resulted in multiple opportunities for my parents to be actively involved in my education through these careers. Growing up in that environment gave me a unique perspective that allowed me to truly identify the benefits this course would provide me very early on in my nursing career. It's provided me the ability to job shadow with advanced practice nurses and physicians in a variety of settings, which helped me establish an early working relationship within the community. It may not be general public knowledge, but any healthcare professional will tell you that early networking and working relationships are a vital component in driving a successful and progressive career in today's healthcare industry. Thank you. Nice job. I don't have a whole speech like that, <laughs> but I would just like to say a couple things. Um, first off, this year I'm not in the Grozio DCTC program, but I know that the first year program did set me up really good for this year. Like I would be completely lost without it. And on top of like gaining my education, before this class I had a couple C's, wasn't doing too good. And since I started this class, like it's made my grades skyrocket with everything and I can honestly say that this is one of the only classes that I really genuinely enjoy going to and honestly it helped me to like personally I has I've started volunteering a lot more because of Miss Metzger and Dr. G and they encouraged me to do better educational and personally thank you great job you guys Thank you guys for um, listening about our health science program. We will hand it over to Miss Ann Gray. Oh, sorry. We have, oh, God, we have one more. I didn't sorry. know. Sorry. That was our... we, one second. I, <laughs> one, one more moment, and then we are out of we here. Um, we had, so one of the things that um, we wanted to show you all are some of our future plans. Um, we all experienced the pandemic. We just celebrated our three-year anniversary of the big shutdown yesterday. Oh. Um, yeah. And it impacted education and healthcare probably more than almost any other industry, with the exception of perhaps technology. And I think that's why we wanted to mention some of the things that we are doing to integrate this so that our students have that leg up and that understanding of technology going into their education, uh, their secondary education. This year, we acquired a, a really special, sophisticated mannequin that we call Aries um, that has the ability to respond to the students and so that they have an idea of how a patient would actually respond. We have a uh, control panel that has all kinds of fun settings and we can control what the students see here and how the mannequin responds to their interventions. Um, one of our future goals would be to um, acquire this augmented reality immersion room. You can see in this photo in the bottom right, that's actually what it would look like. It would be a projected image that would surround the students as if they were in a real patient care atmosphere, say an emergency department. 
Uh, we also would like to continue to grow in terms of our career exploration. This next month, we will be hosting a panel discussion for uh, uh, nurses uh, as we go into nursing month in May so that our students can learn from their experience. And we're also going to be trying to increase our outreach in the clinical affiliations in our community, um, going beyond just the two sites that we have currently uh, for our second year students. Okay, now we will hand it over to you. Yes, Anna. now we are done. <laughs> All right, so for the Educational Careers Program, <clears throat> the Michigan Department of Education and Office of Career and Technical Education is doing a big, huge launch program um, with the education system. Um, and what they're wanting to do is start as early as elementary or middle school and get these careers out there so that we can start building the teaching force back up again. Um, so this course does specialize in working with children in elementary schools and preschools at the moment um, with the option of going into middle school for the second year program. Um, so they do have a two-year program with a third option. The first year program would basically be getting the information for the first year, like the technical things, and I'll show you that in just a second. But the third year um, will actually be an option for them to go out into field placement our credentials require 480 hours of hands-on time with children, and in order to get that in our program, the third year would be all field placement, so they would be placed into classrooms in order to get those hours. Um, so programs do prepare children or the students for post-secondary education in many different career fields in the education uh, setting not only teaching but social work speech therapy and there's a lot of other careers that i've had students going into i had one that ended up at a um, museum and is a curator there but she does all the trips with the girl scouts and the boy scouts overnight trips so she's the one that leads all those activities so there's a lot of careers working with young children so for our first year we go through ethics and professional growth health and safety work-based learning, clinical placements, which I'm gonna have students come up and tell you about that in just a second. Um, cultural competency, growth and development, <clears throat> special populations and diverse learners, strategic partnerships dealing with the community and family members. And then our last part for the first year is classroom management. And now I'm gonna have Mia come up and tell about the field placement. All right, hello everybody. So I am in the first year class, obviously, and I am currently in my second field placement setting. And being with these students and talking to these teachers has helped me learn so much about this like career. And it's really made me like know that I want to go into this. Um, I started off in a kindergarten classroom and I felt really out of place at first. I was like, oh geez, this is scary, I didn't really know what to do, I didn't know um, how to communicate with these kids. But using the knowledge that I gained from Miss Gray and Miss Kemeny, and um, from just interacting with the kids, I learned the best ways to teach them like so much math and like their alphabet and all this different stuff. And by the time I was out of that kindergarten classroom, I had the tools to help first graders. So now I'm helping first graders with sight reading and just regular reading. And um, I'm helping them learn how to focus and I'm helping them just stay on track with their lessons. And it's really great. I've made some really great bonds with these students and I am so happy that I decided to take this course because it has just helped me so much and made me so like reassured in the fact that I wanna go into teaching so it's been really great. And thank you for everything that you've done for us because it's been amazing. You're welcome. Good job. So the first year students go out Mondays and Wednesdays starting in October. Um, they go to December for the first placement. The second placement is from January until about spring break. And then after spring break, they have a third placement. And I do place them the first year um, because we have different school districts. There's like seven different school districts that we work with. Um, and they go into these schools and actually go into classrooms and work with them. Second year, we get into program management, instructional strategies, lesson planning, assessment, and then we talk about career ready practices. 
Um, and then they are certified in CPR and first aid through the American Red Cross. I am the instructor for that, so they get that card in our class. And they also have work-based clinical placements, and I'm going to have Abby come up and talk about that. Hello, my name is Abby Hinsman, and I'm in the second year program. Um, I started last year, and I did the three placements, and then I am in this year, I'm in a first grade classroom, and I actually got to cho choose my classroom this year. Um, I, because I knew I was going to be in there four days a week, I wanted to choose a classroom that I knew I would like, so I chose a teacher I've heard really good things about, and I just love being in the classroom, and I'm in first grade, and it's just the highlight of my day seeing all these kids, and I love when they come up to me and they're like, Miss Hinsman, and then I get to work with them. Um, I've learned so much from this teacher, and I've learned from what I learned from my teachers last year, um, seeing all these different teaching strategies and figuring out what I want to do when I become a teacher. Um, seeing things that I like and seeing things that I would do a little differently. Um, before going into the field, we did, I got CPR certified, which helped me feel really prepared for continuing working with kids, and it makes me feel a lot more comfortable when I'm like babysitting and all that stuff. Um, I would, earlier in the year, we had a lesson where we created our own lesson plan, and we had to go through the Michigan um, website to figure out all the objectives and then we taught the whole class a lesson on something that we were passionate about so I was able to teach a whole lesson on theater and um, and I just love being able to work with these kids and um, we're going on our teaching conference later in April and I went on our teaching conference last year and it's the MIAC conference so the Michigan Association of for the. for the education <laughs> of young children. And I loved being able to go last year because I was able to see all these different presentations about things, about different tools that you can use. And I'm super excited to go back this year. And we even have um, the opportunity to give a presentation of our own. And we are going to be giving a presentation on um, the, how colors affect students' mood and like positive reinforcement posters in the classroom. So being able to do all this research and be, getting all this field experience on something that I'm very passionate about and being in this class has helped me know for a fact I do want a career in early childhood education. Good job. So in order for them to get to the 480 hours um, as a senior, being this is only our second year, um, they do go out into the field starting in January four days a week. And they can go up to middle school at that point if they so choose to work in a higher grade. Um, and again, the third year program for those that start off as sophomores, they can then reach the goal of 480 hours that are required for the certification. And the certification, we do have CDAs and the YDAs. The CDA will allow them to become a teacher, a lead teacher in a preschool setting. And the YDA will allow them to be an assistant in any kind of after school program or any youth program that they um, might do during the summer. And they have the American Red Cross CPR and first aid certification that they obtain in class. And as far as our student leadership, um, we have participated in Educators Rising a long time ago, and then the state said, well, we're not going to allow that program. But they are coming back, so we are getting involved in that. But our leadership has been going to the Michigan Association for the Education of Young Children. And this year, the leadership, like Abby said, is them presenting at this conference. So I'm very excited. Um, there is an organization that's been working with our group, which is the MECA group. And they just did a big article um, on our students. And when we get done presenting, I'm going to be sharing information with them and pictures for them to repost another article about them. So very excited. And that's it. Well, thank good. you. Good job. Good job. Appreciate you taking the time to come. It's really cool things. We've, we've been in the Health Act a couple of times I've been in, and it's really pretty amazing. And the teacher, the program has been fabulous for how long have you been here doing this, Anne? This is my 24th year. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's definitely got a great reputation, so we appreciate it. And good luck. You guys did great speaking in front of us. So. All for you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thanks for coming. Any questions? No. Very well done. Thank you. Good job.
Okay, next on the agenda, we have public participation. Robin, do you have any? Okay, seeing none, we will move on to curriculum office update. Uh, first on it is uh, the Grozio Middle School invent Invention Convention course proposal. Um, Andrea Deshawn is here to present. Hi, Andrea. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Excited to talk to you about a new um, offering for our middle schoolers, which is going to be an elective course. Um, the name we're still tweaking a little bit. Right now we're thinking maybe innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, but again, this is going to be an elective course that will be offered to grades 6 through 8 starting next school year with your generous approval. So I have to give you a little bit of an engaging hook. Um, last month, myself, Julia Roscoe, instructional coach at the high school, uh, Brett Bennett and Justin Tromko, we went to a Future Learning Council in Lansing. And we listened to this excellent speaker, uh, Leah McConaughey. And she was talking about you know, implementing technology into classrooms in really meaningful ways and making sure that the product it really matches the technology. So in her example, she had visited this fourth grade classroom where the kids were super excited to show her their 3D, 3D printer. And so she said, so guys, tell me what you've been doing with this 3D printer. And they said, oh, we've been making Christmas ornaments, and we made some coasters, and we made Ethan a hand. And we, she said, wait, what? You made Ethan a hand? What are you talking about? And she, they said, well, we have a classmate named Ethan, and he doesn't have a hand. And so we decided we were going to make one for him. And so sure enough, that class then used their 3D printer, plus using a ton of um, math lessons, doing like rate and ratio, trying to find, and of course they had adult help, um, but trying to find the perfect rate and ratio to build this little guy a great hand. And so she was talking about how making sure that the products that we're creating with technology become really meaningful to the kids so that it isn't just you know, making coasters for the sake of making coasters. And so then, of course, they made them his own. <coughs> great hand. So with that in mind, right, thinking that there's a lot of great ideas that kids have, and we certainly don't want to stifle their creativity ever, and why not have some kind of a class that would be almost like a shark tank in nature, where students really start with a problem in mind, and then come up with different, different iterations of how they can solve these real world problems. So while we were having this conversation and um, subsequent conversations and district leadership team, Cliff Whitehouse had the opportunity to go to the invention convention in, uh, the, at the Henry Ford. And so we just kind of collectively said we need to really you know, put some thought into perhaps offering this as a course. So the goal of this course, and I think what's most the key words or the key takeaways on this part is it is a safe learning environment where kids are encouraged to take risks. But the biggest part is being comfortable in that ambiguity. Because so many times, especially in middle school, right, it's like, okay, what's the answer? What's the, you know, let me solve the problem. Let me, let me finish the chapter, and then I can move on to my next learning target. But really stressing of, you know, it's okay to be comfortable in, agu in, in ambiguity, excuse me, and increase your self-confidence and show resiliency as you're going through that ambiguity, as you're trying to solve your problem and think of all of your possible solutions. And so that's the goal of the course, is that students would begin by identifying the problem and building their solutions. And so they would have structured yet unstructured creative problem solving and collaboration and perseverance experiences while they just work through their problem and figuring out the different um, inventions that they would like to come up with to solve these problems. And so the actual um, invention convention curriculum, which we'll be using pieces of along with other invention curriculums, um, this version talks about the seven steps of the process where students identify their problem and then go through their unique solutions and their plans and how they'll make the inventions and creating their prototypes and then testing it, of course, and then presenting it to others. And so what's most exciting about this is it definitely aligns with the goals of the strategic plan and portrait of a graduate, which again, we're preparing students for 21st century experiences um, with really cool opportunities for them to explore their interests. And so there is some front-loading involved as far as there's 
I believe, 17 like front-loaded lessons that are kind of developed to be maybe in one class sitting, but they probably would end up being maybe three and a half to four weeks at the beginning of the semester of just kind of like, here's how you go through the process, here are the step-by-steps. Um, for the designing and the building and the testing. And then they would have the rest of the semester to work on their prototypes, work on their iterations. And we're thinking that this would probably be a first semester course because the students would want to finish up their projects in January so that then they'll be prepared for the regional um, step, which is held at the Henry Ford each year. And then there is also um, some additional curriculums that go along with more um, opportunities for kids if they want to continue into a second semester. We would propose that this class be offered to sixth, seventh, and eighth grade students. And then if kids want to continue to take it year after year, they could. And it would be a great opportunity for perhaps a student who's already taken it as a sixth or a seventh grader who could then step in as like a mentoring um, to a younger student if they take it more than one year. And so this is just a brief video about the invention convention that again is held at uh, the Henry Ford, at least from the regional perspective. Just wanted, this is very short, just wanted to show you, um, here's some really cool things that kids have invented and it's really cute to hear them talk about their inventions and how proud they are as well. I actually love inventing so much. Just putting together whatever I can. I've always liked making stuff, coming up with ideas, finding solutions to problems. And I think also the sole purpose of inventing is just to solve problems. That's what I want to do, solve problems that exist in the world. I love inventing. I love inventing. I love inventing. It's so great to see everybody back in person after a two year hiatus. These kids are our future. And if we can get kids around the globe inventing, working together, learning from mistakes, that's the problem solving we need for our future. And that's really the impact that we want this program to have. And with this, it kind of gives them a rubric. It gives them a purpose. It gives them some kind of drive in order to keep going. So our invention is an automatic whiteboard erasing robot. And it's meant to save time in classrooms by erasing the board. My invention is called Cargility. It is a handrail that attaches to the striker plate of a car door for mobility and accessibility for people who struggle getting in and out of cars. We have seen many people um, taking expired um, products, so we thought it would be helpful to have something like an indicator to show when your product expires or not. Hi Card, I have developed is a regular shopping cart with a computer chip attached to it that allows it to go to the car to turn autonomously using a computer called a Raspberry Pi. The beep scanner, it's a combination of a gun detector, camera, scanner, and an ID badge. Innovation is a core value at Delta Dental and it's a huge part of our company culture. Programs like Invention Convention Michigan help us build healthy, smart, vibrant communities for all. I hope all the students take away that they have the ability to analyze problems and tinker and solve and find solutions that are meaningful to themselves and are helpful to others. I've learned how to overcome challenges and how to identify problems, which will be really useful in the future. If you look at my table, there's a bunch of broken pieces on there of failed attempts, and I just kept wanting to iterate and keep creating. Even through difficult times with our project just not working, we can't give up because some people really need this. It's not worth it just to give up and say, I can't do it anymore. You gotta keep trying and you gotta revise your work. You have to try your hardest, you have to always work hard. I think I'm most proud of that we're like in the Henry Ford Museum presenting an invention. Like that in itself is an accomplishment, I feel. The thing I'm most proud of with my invention is how it's actually a working prototype. It's not like a cardboard piece. It's like actually, it actually works like an app. And I'm really proud of our collaboration and our ideating. I can make a real impact on the world around me and I can do something about my problems instead of just complaining about it or just posting about it. 
I'm most proud of helping other people because that's what inventing is about at the end of the day. It's trying to make other people's lives easier. Definitely had to add that just to show you some of the really cool things that you know these kids were capable of, but certainly our Gross Hill students. I can already think of like a good at least 30 kids who are going to be chomping at the bit to sign up for this course. And I can already think of some of the great ideas that they're going to have. So really, really excited um, and would really appreciate the opportunity to add this to our course description guide to give kids great opportunities with more STEM STEAM offerings. Any questions? Thank you, Andrea. Do you have oh, any Andrea, will um, entry into Invention Convention be part of the course, or will that be covered? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Okay. That will be part of it. So we have we're really lucky to have the Henry Ford as a local resource that they host not only the regional but I believe the state, and they did the national last year, I believe as well. Um, so again, just for the kids to. And, and, you know, I, I thought it was important that you saw the video, too, just to not think that it's just like a glorified science project, because there's definitely so much more to it than that. I think it was really, you know, helpful that they um, presented on poster boards just for ease of transporting and whatnot. But I think just the, just the idea of, like, look at all the failed attempts, right? You're not supposed to get everything right immediately all the time. Such a cool, cool Have other districts that have been there done this as a course? I believe that there are some that have run it as a course, and then there's some that have run it more as like an after-school club. Um, but we're really excited because we just keep getting more and more feedback that kids would like more opportunities for more electives at the middle school level. Um, one of the things I actually reached out to someone involved with Invention Convention today at the Henry Ford that um, we're trying to figure out what we can do to offer it as the second semester, and then um, could they then enter the competition the following year, and how that, so we really do want it to be a two semester, mm -hmm. or be able to offer it both semesters, so we can get as many kids in, um, as possible. I, I was telling these guys, I was, I just happened to mention it to my son when we were talking about, so he's a sixth grader, as you know, and within two minutes, he shared probably 15 inventions with me. I would say 12 of which were actually really, <laughs> really good. And he told me I'm not allowed to tell anybody because he's going to, you know, patent it one day. But just it was so, like, heartening to me. I would have, it would have taken me two years to come up with one invention idea. And these kids are just full of ideas. And I'm just so excited to see what, what they're um, actually going to come up with. Mm -hmm. Very exciting opportunity for sure. Thank you. Well, thanks, Andrea. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, next on the agenda, we have uh, a group of different chorus, the Madrigals, the Beginning Choir Chorus, and the Mixed Chorus, and we have Sam Ramirez here to present. Hi, Sam. Hi, everybody. Uh, yep, my name is Sam Ramirez. I'm the new choir teacher here uh, with Groziel Schools. I'm at the middle school and the high school. It's very nice to officially be here and meet you all in person. Um, even though I haven't been here for the longest time, I am already starting to think of ways to grow our program back up to the numbers it has been pre-pandemic, uh, starting hopefully within the next semester. Um, if you want to look over here or anywhere that's comfortable for you, uh, you can see with our numbers right just right before that pandemic, the first those couple years before we were at our highest that it's been in the last few years, and, and since the pandemic we started to dwindle down a little bit, and um, I would really like to get those numbers up. And uh, something that actually sparked this idea. Um, Literally my first day coming in on January 9th, uh, I had a student come up to me at the middle school and say, I really wanted to be a part of chorus this year, but there weren't enough boys that signed up for men's chorus, so I couldn't do it. And that kind of was like, well, then why didn't they just put you in the other chorus? Oh, it's because it's written women's and men's chorus. And so what I would like to do first thing is to take out the gender and uh, have co-ed choir <laughs> open for everybody. And um, this is uh, how 
hopefully it's going to uh, that the way that it's going to be set up. So with sixth grade, um, we have a, an open enrolled sixth grade beginning course. So that is not going to change so much. Um, <laughs> the course will prepare students to sing in an ensemble as well as building up their self-confidence and efficacy with their music, music, musical skills or vocally, orally, and written. Um, this would be for grade six, and uh, preferably I'd like to have them for two semesters, but of course with different scheduling and different electives that are only offered certain times. Um, if they have to be in for only one semester, that is totally fine. After that semester, uh, they will either move directly to the open mixed seventh and eighth grade chorus, or they will have an opportunity to audition for our intermediate group called the Mini Madrigals. More on that in a second. Uh, nope, not that button. All right. Uh, the beginning chorus, yeah, it's a class open for any sixth grader who is interested in singing in a chorus. Uh, it's a mixture of chorus and general music. Uh, with uh, They'll do a mixture of singing and learning music theory as well as getting into a little bit of music technology. Um, the group will perform in our regular uh, school concerts. I'm planning to combine middle and high school choir concerts to be the same dates. So I'm hoping to have four of those to each semester, October, December, March, and May, roughly. Um, after participating in the group, yes, for at least one semester, students can either move up to the 7th and 8th grade chorus or audition for those mini madrigals, like I said. Not that button. Okay. Uh, so with 7th and 8th grade, um, as of now, they are separate. And I have the women's 7th grade, and I have the women's 8th grade, and I don't have any boys, unfortunately, right now. But hopefully that will change. Um, this uh, chorus is going to be pretty much just like the beginning sixth grade, but now we're moving into uh, two parts, possibly three parts. Right now, the seventh grade is already tackling three-part harmony, and they're doing pretty darn good with it, if I do say so myself. And uh, the students uh, will uh, receive feedback from other professionals, like going to festival, going to our Cedar Point trip that we usually do. Um, and uh, possibly getting in some guest clinicians here. I uh, have friends all around Down River who are musicians and vocalists. I'm really good friends with the vocal directors at Woodhaven and Wyandotte and Southgate. And so if we could maybe do a little bit of a share day or something like that. Um, this would be combined. Sorry, my voice is just... I sound like a terrible vo uh, voice teacher right now. Um, this would be a combined 7th and 8th grade uh, just to get them all used to. Once we get to the high school, they're going to be with mixed classes anyway. So this is a good way to get them kind of in that mindset. Um, students will have the opportunity. They can either move from the 7th and 8th grade course to they could go to the open concert choir in high school if they're in eighth grade or after one semester they will also have the opportunity to possibly uh, move up to the mini madrigals depending on what semester they're in or audition for the madrigals proper in high school uh so after yes, basically after one semester they are capable they are able to audition um and, and i read all of that <laughs> so this brings me to the mini madrigals. This would, I am hoping to open for sixth through eighth grade. Uh, this would be an audition course. And so what the students will have to do, they'll just have to come up to me. They'll have to, uh, right now I have the date set for the middle school at uh, the Wednesday before spring break, a week from tomorrow. And they have to sing 60 seconds of a song, and then I'll do some pitch matching with them. If they're already in chorus right now, they already know that they have to uh, sing a passage of one of our songs in and hold their part in three-part harmony. To, um, that's not going to make them or break them, but I just want to see if they can do it right now. And... Uh, 
with that many madrigals, uh, that would be a two semester. That would hopefully be a two semester course, keeping them the entire year. Uh, once they're in, they do not have to re audition. They're they are in. Uh, should they want to stay? And then for any eighth grader who is in that mini madrigal class, they would move directly into the higher choir, which is the madrigals at the high school, without an audition. Um, so anyone who's in the open class, they would still have to audition, and they are definitely welcome to. But the mini madrigals, should they want to move on, they are just able to move right on. And I believe the best way to grow our numbers and to get better retention is to get them in the middle school so they can be with me for three years and then move on to another four years with me. <laughs> and so that is uh, my plan for the next uh, year at the middle school. High school, everything's staying the same pretty much for now. Um, maybe I'll be here next year with a different situation with that. But uh, that, is, that concludes my explanation for what to expect for next year, should we be approved. Thank you, Mr. Ramirez. We really appreciate that. I just wanted to add on what, what uh, Mr. Ramirez was talking about. Our district just is not large enough to have enough numbers to be able to hold or to have those specialized classes. So really um, what he's helped us do is kind of reorganize things so that you know, it, we have as many kids as possible in the entire middle school that will be able to take it because we'll be able to offer it and it will be a selective. So thank you so much for just coming in as a brand new teacher and being willing to work with our, our leadership team and um, just saying, hey, what do we need to do? Work together to grow the music program. And I'm just super, and I know um, Mrs. Kalis is too, we're just really excited about the future of the music program within within the district. But that's just my two cents. Thanks. Mm -hmm. That's great. Any other, any other questions? Good job. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate it. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Next on the agenda, we have board curriculum committee update. Yeah, nothing really to add. We met up last Friday. The minutes were posted in the board book. Um, Your mic. Oh. Nothing really to add. Uh, met last Friday. We went through detail. I mean, Nadia, Jeff was with us, but Nadia, he's not here tonight, Nadia. I mean, I'm both the enthusiasm <laughs> by Justin on these programs and trying to get kids back in, especially into the music stuff, is just very exciting. And then the, the invention one is very exciting to the enthusiasm and just all the things that, whether you're going to go on to college or not, how adaptable those skills will be. Great. Now, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, I think, you know, we had the chance to preview some of these presentations and really dig into it there and I'm excited about it too so thank you uh, for all the work I just wanted to just mention um, there there these are any type of budget um, it's very minimal in terms of the needs and um, the invention um, class we're excited about because that's going to be a, a perfect class to use in our new stem labs that we're building with the bond too so as far as financial and um, the you know the resources for the district um, minimal. Perfect, thank you. Okay, moving on to information and discussion. First, we have fiber maintenance, the E-rate bid, and core switch E-rate bid. Hi, John. Hello. I don't know if this technology is exciting as all the curriculum changes, but I'll, Back to I'll do my best. <laughs> uh, so first of all, all the buildings in the district are connected by fiber optic cable. And that's really important because it, it, it allows us to have very uh, high speeds and also it's owned, these, this cable is, or this fiber is owned by the district so that really cuts costs in our, uh, in our technology budget. And so, uh, this, this, but this fiber is what we uh, connect everything with so it's very important to make sure that, that it's maintained and it's always available because if, if we have a uh, disconnect from one school to the next, that means that school may be down and out of business. So the, the goal is to keep uh, our network as highly available as possible. So what we did is we uh, submitted a E-rate RFP for fiber maintenance. This is something we've done uh, year after year for many years now. Uh, we had one vendor uh, uh, submit a bid called Amcom. Amcom is who we've used in the past um, very successfully for this service. 
uh, AMCOM submitted a bid, and um, what I'm recommending is that we uh, go with the bid from AMCOM. Uh, the amount, uh, uh, the maximum amount uh, for fiber maintenance is 26750 and the way that works <clears throat> is if we have a good year, we have no issues, which is normally what happens, we don't have to pay anything. But if we have a really big issue, let's say we have a big uh, a tree fall on a fiber line or something like that, and we have a whole lot of work that needs to be done to bring it back up, the maximum we will pay under this contract is uh, 26750 uh, What What is recommended is an annual uh, line inspection, which, is, which is, comes at a cost of $5,500. Uh, we didn't do this last year, but I do recommend we do this the upcoming year just to make sure, because as I said, <coughs> if we do have a, an outage, yes, we can get it cost uh, effectively repaired, but it, it would uh, mean an outage for a, a, at least one building. Um, and uh, the cost for this uh, service is uh, planned to be, uh, if you, you approve it, will be uh, 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 funded by the sinking fund. Great. The 5500 is in addition to the up to 26? It's actually included in the 26. Oh, it's the question. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Any other? Questions? Any other? Uh, uh, Responses to the RFP submitted, or was just AMCOM? Was AM, um, AMCOM was the only response. <clears throat> and how much more was it than last year? Just for, I think, yeah. Actually, I don't have that off the top of my head, but I know that it's it's in line with what we've paid okay. in the past. I'm asking. Thank you. How often do they find a problem when they look through? You know, come do a maintenance check on that. Is that yearly they find a problem, or not very often? I'd say about every three, four years, they find some issues, some trees that need to be trimmed or something where, hey, let's be proactive and take care of this before it becomes an issue. Yep. Any other questions? Okay. You know, is that all that, John? That's all on this one. I, I have another item after this. Okay. So the... Uh, the next recommendation I'm going to make is to, to uh, upgrade and replace the core switch uh, in the district. Just to explain what that is, think of it as the backbone to our network. This is all uh, network and internet activity that goes through, whether it be going out, coming in, uh, whatever direction it may be going, goes through this core switch. So it's a very important uh, device that's in our network. Uh, the core switch that we have currently was installed in 2016, and it's reached end of life. And releases are no longer available for it. And so uh, it being such an important appliance to us, we, we want to make sure we constantly apply uh, maintenance updates to it so we don't have viruses coming into the district or anything like that. And because we've now reached end of life, you know, it's really time to upgrade it. Uh, we also did an E-rate RFP uh, for the core switch as well. We did get two responses to this bid. CDWG came in with the lowest bid. Uh, the cost is $75,854. Because this is an E-rate bid, we uh, get a 40% E-rate rebate if we uh, pursue, if we uh, go forward with this. Um, so that brings it down to an actual cost of 45513 and the plan for this is for it to be funded with bond funds. Um, installation for the switch would be done by Wayne Risa under the network services uh, contract. Is what there is any downtime associated with making the change? Very, very minimal. Uh, be, the, the switchover will be done during off hours, so it would really not affect too many people, but yeah. John, this was installed in 2016. What's the anticipated lifespan of this? About seven years. About the same? Yep, we're right about there. John, can you, um, for public, for the public, can you explain what an E-rate bid is? Yes, yeah, so E-rate bid is something that uh, we're able to do once a year. And E-rate covers certain types of technology. Uh, typically, it's like hardware that can be affixed somewhere in our network, a switch, uh, a, uh, a router, that type of, of uh, technology. Um, so the core switch, that would fall under that. The fiber also, because that's that, net, think of uh, technology infrastructure, those types of items uh, kind of fall under the E-rate program. 
And what we're allowed to do is submit a bid, a bid uh, for these types of items once a year, which is this time. Uh, and when, when, when a uh, E-rate project is approved, it has to be uh, submitted to E-rate by the end of March. So that's why I'm here talking to you about this tonight. And you receive a rebate. For, yes, <clears throat> correct. Typically a 40% rebate. Any type of warranty on the course switch? Uh, they, they do. I believe it's a three-year warranty. Okay. Yes. Any other questions? Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate it. Um, moving on to the next item, we have consent grouping. Uh, can I have a motion, please? I move that the Gross Hill Township Schools Board of Education approve the consent grouping items as presented. And this is the payment of the bills for February 1st, 23 through February 28th, 23, and the amount of $1,123,836.17, and the approval of the February 28th, 2023 regular meeting minutes. Any discussion? Questions? No. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Next under action item, um, we have the fiber maintenance E-rate bid. I move that the Gross Hills Township Schools Board of Education approve the purchase as presented. Any discussion on this? No, this is gonna be through the 26,750 for the AMCOM Telecommunication uh, Inc. And under that is 14,450 hour block to be used as needed, including repairs, misdig, emergencies, call outs, emergency responses. $6,800 for the estimate cost of replacement parts per year and $5,500 for the annual line inspection that we just talked about be, uh, just now. We've been hoping to get a rebate on that um, from that. Any qu other questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Next we have the core switch bid. Move that the Girl Shield Township Schools Board of Education approves the purchase as presented. Support. John just presented for the total of 75854 uh, after the 40% E-rate rebate, there's a net of 45,513 cost funded by the bond. Any other comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Next, we have new middle school courses. Can I have a motion, please? I move that the Grozeal Township Schools Board of Education approve the new middle school courses for the 2023 and 2024 year as presented. Support. And this is the um, presentations that we just heard, Invention and Entrepreneurship, Beginning Chorus, Mini Magicals, and the Mixed Chorus. And any other comments? Oh. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Next, we move on to the superintendent update. Okay, I have a couple um, short presentations for you, but while uh, Robin's getting that ready, um, a few announcements that I wanted to share. First, I just wanted to give a shout out to Mrs. Garza and the fifth grade team um, for listening to our students and parents and going back to work on um, coming up with an alternative to address some of the learning gaps that they were concerned about um, and you know, changing the recess, the fifth grade recess um, decision. And just again, um, I sent Brandon um, a, a card just telling him how proud we were of him coming and speak with us last, um, last meeting. Uh, we had a wonderful day today with our bond sale. We did have a successful bond sale for the first series of bonds. Um, I believe it was a little over $30 million worth of bonds. Um, we did something a little different and we involved our high school students in that process. We had about 40 students attend um, at the Wayne County Community College Down River campus and they actually got to see it live at, at um, happen live and then our entire bond team from the underwriter to plant moran to our bond council through troon um, uh, everyone was there and the students were able to ask questions directly of all of them including their career pathways and how they got to where they were and so it just was a it was a really wonderful day of learning and it was just a it was a great day we were smiling the whole the whole time um i just received um i looked in panic just because our kids are in washington dc right now and i just received a text message from mrs layman but it's a video so i'm assuming it's a cute little video so just want to say hi to our washington dc kids and hope they're having a great time there um, and then these, I wanted to announce to parents that the scheduling process is underway at both the middle school 
school and high school and just encourage parents to be involved in that and fill out those course request sheets with their students, call counselors, ask questions, review our course selection guides. We have a lot of um, a lot of work happening with our strategic plan where we're, you know, um, putting in new courses, new opportunities, um, especially at the secondary level right now. And I just don't want people to think that it's, you know, the same thing that they're used to. There's a lot of new stuff and we just want to encourage people to check that out. I want to give a shout out to our maintenance and custodial staff. This has been the never ending winter um, and they continue to come in early mornings, make sure lots are cleared, make sure we can still have gyro basketball, have a a board curriculum committee on a on a snow day and just really appreciate them they're kind of out there doing that without anyone knowing so we wanted to make sure we, and then um and then which one do we have okay enrollment trends so um usually about this time um give or take a month i will share with the board um, some information on school of choice enrollment where we're at so i'm just going to go through um, just a few slides that I have put together. I did ask Michelle DiMaggio, she's our um, data coordinator for the district, but she also handles school of choice for us and handles all enrollments. So I know where my knowledge ends and I, I know you guys ask questions. And so I asked Michelle to be here just in case there were some questions that you might have that I'm unable to answer. So, oh, and I have my little clicker here, so. All right, Robin. Am I set or user error or I, I did that one too and this is what I'm getting. <laughs> Will you be my advancer? <laughs> sure. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Okay, so this first uh, slide is actually, um, they call it, we get this information from IDEX. Um, I've shown you re, um, graphs coming out of there and data analytics, or it's our data analytics tool for the district. And this is the market share um, uh, information. And so as you can see, Grozeal is the uh, blue line at the top. The other districts, the peer with IDEX, we're able to select the peer groups that we want to compare ourselves again, uh, against. They actually have a, um, uh, a selection that you can click that is school of choice. And what that is, is it's all the all the districts that we share school of choice students with, whether it's coming or going. So that's what the peer group is that you're looking at there for this particular slide. Um, and as you can see, we have about a 92% market share, which means of all the students that live on the island, 92% of them are attending our school district with about 8% attending um, other, other um, schools, which is really high. As you can see, it is um, higher than any of our peer districts. And uh, go ahead and advance. Uh, Robin. This next slide is I just opened it up. I opened up the peer group uh, to Wayne County um, and we're still that blue line at the top. So you can just see comparatively, we have a very high market share. Um, I don't believe anybody is even over 90% other than Grozeal. And then when you go to the next slide, um, the peer districts, the green line that you see, what I set there was, um, and you know, the board will remember this, we talk about the notably successful districts that we like to compare ourselves with when we talk about student achievement. These are districts such as Novi, Northville, Plymouth Canton, Ann Arbor schools that have historically high achievement rates that um, we look at. They're the green line. So I wanted to look at um, well, other high achieving school districts such as Grozeal, how does our market share compare to their market share? And as you can see, again, um, significantly higher um, than those um, other school districts. Go ahead, Robin. And what's the yellow line? I'm sorry. And then the yellow line, uh, if you go back, that's all. Um, LEA, that, that's um, not PSAs, that's not charter schools, but that's all. Uh, the yellow line is public schools in the state. And then this is um, just showing district students that are non-resident and um, what the trend looks um, with, again, with our school of choice peers. So this is just what percentage of your student body are actually non-resident students. So as you can see, we, we really stay under that 10% mark. So when we're setting school of choice numbers and you approve those last month, um, the board likes to kind of stay around that 10% mark. 
Um, we obviously welcome school of choice families and want them here, um, but I know it's a, it's a board goal to make sure that the percentages stay low. But as you can see, and this is important when you look at the next slide, is that, but before we advance there, um, all the other school districts are higher than us. They have, um, you know, significantly, some of them significantly more uh, school of choice students as part of their population. So when you go to the next slide, Robin. So this is change in student count from 2010 to 2023. Um, as you can see, we've had about the same amount of change in our student count as Trenton. Um, and then the, the bars over to the right where they've actually had an increase to their student count, this is what I was referring to. If you look at those school districts, Riverview, um, I believe they're at, um, if we looked at that, if we go back a slide, it was like 40 or 50% of their students are school of choice. Um, they're at way at the top there, so almost 50%. So, you know, when they have an increase in enrollment, most of Lincoln Park, Woodhaven, Riverview, Wyandotte, um, you're going to see, you know, a uh, heavy population of school of choice. Um, this, this one, and then um, you don't have, it'll actually zoom in on the next slides, but I just wanted to show you overall. This is the green on the left are our students lost and where they're going. The uh, blue on the right is students gained and where we're getting students from. So that very first one is Gibraltar. So go ahead and advance, um, Robin, for me. So if you see, we have lost 10 students to Gibraltar. Now this is K-12, so this is all students. Um, we've lost about 10, um, but we've actually gained about 30 from Gibraltar. And um, then you can kind of see the other ones. So, and I, um, this is one of the things that Michelle can help me with as well. But when we look at um, Clarkston, South, Red, well, South Redford, um, a lot of, and even Wyandotte, they have specialized special ed programs. Clarkston, Oxford, um, they have virtual, full virtual programs. So a lot of these schools that you're seeing in red, um, they're not necessarily in their traditional um, uh, K-12 schooling program, but rather they're in a specialized special education um, programming or a virtual programming. And then this is the bottom half. Um, again, um, uh, let's see, Michigan International, that is going to be an online school. Michigan Great Lakes, that's an online school. Berkeley has an online school. Garden City has a specialized special ed um, program. Uh, Michigan Virtual, obviously, is an online. Oakland International. Um, and then wind out, like I said, has a specialized um, special ed program. And then when you look at districts such as like Trenton, even Wyandotte, um, but Gibraltar, Trenton and Gibraltar specifically, we have a lot of um, parents who live on the island who work in those school districts and then take their children with them to work every day, obviously, for, for ease of information. So you can kind of see, you know, when you think back to the, the market share at 92%, of the 8% um, that we don't have, here's the reason, here's a lot of the, the reason where those 8% are going. Now does that track, it doesn't track private school though. Correct? So I'm gonna show you the next slide. So we're gonna go there. So it doesn't, um, I wasn't able, I'm not able to um, on through IDEX track the parochial, but I was able to go into um, actually um, Michigan High School Athletic Association tracks enrollment numbers um, because they set divisions, what um, divisions parochial and privates compete in. So this one's kind of hard to see. Um, I'm actually going to cheat and look at my sheet in front of me. But Grove's Yield, what I did was is I looked at enrollment numbers. This is going to be specifically at their high school because I can't pull the younger um, uh, ages. But, you know, everything just kind of flows to the high school anyways. The top line, uh, the yellow line is Grove's Yield. So back in 2009, we had 640 students at our high school, and in 2022, we were down to 555. The yellow dotted line is going to be your trend line, right? So that's your line of best fit. So that just kind of shows you what the slope is in terms of the percent decrease over time. 
Then when you look at the blue line, that's going to be Cabrini. And Cabrini in 2009, um, just reading these because I know it's hard, is uh, they had an enrollment of 429. And then in 2022, they were down to 211. So Cabrini's lost, uh, you know, over 50% of their students in that same amount of time. And then really you see the same thing with Gabriel Richard. Back in 2009, they had 439 students and they're down to 238 students. So really what this is showing is not necessarily answering your question, Scooter, about where kids are going, but it does talk about the impact of loss, you know, student loss and that it's everywhere. And that it's not, you know, this is what we're talking about when we talk about lower birth rates, um, you know, people aren't having children at the same rates as before and all the things that we've talked about within our strategic plan you know, it's it's not just um, public schools. Everybody is is feeling that. So I think Michelle has a comment. So I understand that 92%, that's 92% of children going to public schools, not all schools. It's 92% of this, the school age children who live on the island that attending Groziel Township School. So it's our market share of how many kids on the island we're capturing that are attending our school. The other 8% are attending other schools. Other public schools, public and private, actually. Private. Yep. So when we're doing our ninety-two percent, ninety, that's our number of Grozil children in our denominator that are attending Grozil schools, and our denominator is our school-age children attending our total number of school-age children. Correct. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I didn't know if there was any other questions for Michelle, even or myself, or was good. Very helpful. Yeah, that was interesting. Okay. Thank you so much for being here tonight, Michelle. I appreciate it. I don't know why I turned off my mic. I have one more presentation, and this is um, we do a um, I give the board a quarterly report as to our progress on the strategic plan. Um, once again, really excited to present this to you tonight. And I always wish um, my entire team was 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 here to be able to celebrate because there's so much to celebrate. But I know they're watching from home. Um, so go ahead, Robin. Thank you. So this is our goal number one, implement a personalized educational experience to support the growth and achievement of the whole child. Those little red check marks over on the right are all the targets um, that we've already achieved for this school year. So we're at about 85% progress towards our targets. Um, and then I'll go into a little bit more detail. Go ahead, Robin. So we're gonna just talk about some glows and grows. So in terms of glow, glows, we have our PLC infrastructure in place. Um, at, uh, we have PLC leaders at all levels, K-12. We have our teams are meeting regularly and our instructional learning cycles are happening. Our framework, our instructional framework um, has been implemented district-wide. Our ELA curriculum audit is completed and is actively being utilized in the curriculum adoption process right now for a new ELA curriculum. And then our work-based learning program is in place and additional partnerships are, are now available. K-12 
continuing. I had to do two slides for GLOWS this time, which was great. <laughs> um, our instructional framework, just continuing that both our principals and our instructional coaches are utilizing the framework in their work. And then the district leadership team is ut utilizing that framework during our instructional rounds. You've all been a part of those rounds and have seen how we've used that. So it's not just a, a framework that you know we say we use, but we're actively implementing it, which is all about research-based instructional strategies in the classroom. Classroom. Our building ILT meetings are, are implemented, and what this is is the PLC leaders meet monthly with their principals to talk about how PLCs are going to share um, with one another, build each other up, talk about challenges, and work through challenges. Um, and then the new curriculum adoption process was approved by the board, um, and it's already obviously been utilized to add new courses to our programming. So I think you guys just approved that just a couple months ago, and then we're already bringing courses through for approval. Market value assets, we have DCTC, virtual, and work-based learning are all being promoted to our students, and then we added a new virtual um, catalog was approved by the board, and then we also have new work-based learning placements for 23-24. And then as Cliff talked about last meeting, we had our first hire, too. Our grows, things we're still working on, is that our DLT agreed that adding SEL competencies into the framework this year was too much for teachers. Um, if you Can you go back to the first slide, Robin, with the, um, the targets? Go back like two, three slides. Yeah, that one. Thank you. So uh, I think it is, yes. Yeah. So the third target down says district instructional framework model implemented district-wide, including SEL competencies. Um, I wanted to point, because we checked it off, but I wanted to point this out because, um, you know, what, what, what happens is, is we have really lofty goals that we come up with, and then we get into the work, and then we realize we might be overloading our teachers. And so one thing we figured out really quick was that implementing the instructional framework as written with the research-based strategies was enough for our teachers and our staff to, to bite off, you know, for this first year, and then it's not a good time to add those SEL competencies. So we're going to make that modification for next year. Excuse my ignorance. Remind sure. me what SEL is. Yeah, that is social emotional learning. So we are going to use the Castle framework um, for working with students on that, and so we're just kind of we're just moving that to a later year. Um, portrait of a graduate was is completed. Um, again, what, what happened was is we went to, we were going to incorporate it into our instructional framework and we went to a future learning council meeting, which is what Andrea had talked about and um, I've talked to you all about it. It's that really future focused work with other um, innovational leaders in the, in the district and what we heard um, from people that were there that had done it was don't do it how we planned on doing it. So we stopped and we, we learned from them and listened to them and just need to rework what our implementation plan is gonna be. So we've implemented the instructional framework and we have the portrait and we're developing courses like you saw tonight that align with the um, uh, portrait, but infusing it into our instructional framework, we still gotta wrap our heads around you know, what that'll look like and if it's how we want to promote the, the, the portrait. So we need to do some more thinking around that. Market value assets. Um, again, a 25% increase was too high for year one. I, I chose that. I'm not sure what I was thinking. That's incredibly high for the first year when Cliff were just trying to get programs in place. Um, not necessarily able to actually get the students in the program. Um, so we're not going to be able to meet that 25% increase, but we definitely have the new programs in place. So. So goal two is about developing a robust partnership with all community members, organizations, businesses, and local government to create an inclusive community um, of stakeholders. And we believe we're about 75% progress towards our targets. Um, and then if we go into the next slide, here's our glows and grows. We do have a new website launched. Um, we've gotten a lot of positive feedback on that, um, so we're, we're happy about that. We have new partnerships in place formed with various groups. Um, I have um, Danielle um, West from Rotary is helping us with STEM, and even the um, invention convention class that was talked about tonight um, was um, a parent reached out to me. This is how it started. A parent reached out to me last year, 
and um, just talked to me about it. It was Andrea um, O'Donnell, and I did some research on it um, and then s asked Cliff to go and be a judge just to check it out, and then that's how it got the ball rolling. And the reason why I bring that up is because a huge part of this goal and the strategic plan is about doing a better job of utilizing the community resources that exist on the island, and we had a lot of discussions during the strategic planning process that there's a lot of you know, parents and community members that have skills and knowledge and, and, and workplaces and all kinds of things that we can tap into that we weren't doing as good a job as we could be. And so that's just a great example of a parent bringing something forward that she had participated in through some other, I don't remember, and now it's gonna be a course in our middle school. Um, parent community volunteers, um, we had the new program at the middle school with uh, parents on patrol. The community or communication committee um, has been, it was created and we've met several times and then the community engagement events, um, it's hard to believe that that was all this school year, but it's just that was all wrapped around our bond, um, bond work. And then continuing, um, we, as for grows in this area, we need to roll out the app to G app. Um, so we rolled out the website, but we are talking now about how we're going to roll out the app to parents and make sure that that's a successful rollout. Um, the communication committee, we're meeting, but we are not close to having a communication plan written. And then our student advancement coordinator is working um, with the DLT to modify administrative guidelines to align with strategic plans. So we've got some administrative guidelines in place that are outdated when it comes to dual enrollment and things like that. And so that's one of the things that we're working on in terms of growth. Goal three is to create and continuously provide safe future focused learning environments and facilities. Um, it's so great to be in this place right now because when we developed that goal as a strategic plan committee, we did not know we were going to pass that bond, and yet we were still committed to writing a goal that said we were going to provide safe, future-focused learning environments and facilities. So I'm really glad that we have the, the money to, to, to do that. Um, and we believe we're about 70% um, you know, progress on those targets. So our GLOWs are, we have our 10-year capital plan is completed, our bond community forums were completed, we've trained all of our staff on our emergency operations plan, I'm meeting regularly with the leadership of the Girls Yield Police Department on our emergency operations plan, we're even continuing to modify that and work on that, we've got new work-based learning placements for 23-24, we've got a student at the Guidance Center, um, we have a student working in a PT environment somewhere, I can't remember. Um, um, and then our bond committees were are um, organized right now in place with stakeholders from the community. I had mentioned that at the last board meeting, and I got some emails from people that heard me say that and um, want to be part of those. So we have local community members on those bond design teams. Um, in terms of our grows, we have our um, DLT um, determined that the target around um, what it said was that we were going to train our staff on how to utilize flexible learning spaces in their classrooms to increase achievement. And we just decided that that was not a good idea. Uh, once again, too much in year one. And then also, um, it's now that we've passed the bond and we're going to get new furniture everywhere, it's kind of like, why don't we wait for the design process to play out a little bit so we can see what, what furniture we're going to have in the classrooms and then work with our teachers on how to use that furniture. And then the technology plan, um, the five-year tech plan has started. Uh, John has um, shared that with the DLT and received feedback from the DLT, and he's continuing to work on that, but it's not completed at this time. So just in conclusion, we're really proud of our progress. Um, one of the things that we talked about as a team when we were reviewing the targets was just how awesome, you, there was a lot of comments about um, the team feeling like this was not a strategic plan that was written and put on a shelf and then submitted to MDE and we checked off a box, but that we're really living this strategic plan and it guides everything that we do and people are versed in it and we really have some really clear focus um, and that was just really exciting. Um, it wasn't news to me. I, obviously, that was the plan all along, but it was, it was really neat to see the team and just how they were connecting that and saying, wow, Val, 
like we're really doing it. Like it, it was, it was nice for them to see the fruits of their labor because they've all worked so hard on it, including our obviously our staff in the buildings as well. And then right now, what we're doing is we're working on writing targets for 23-24. and then we'll bring those to the board um, before the end of this school year. And that's all I have for tonight, unless there's questions about the strategic plan. That was really good. Well that was really good. And and you do. It's good to have it documented down because otherwise we I wouldn't remember all the things that you you know that you really those hurdles that you've come across through the year. So, any other questions for Val? No, good yes, work. Well done. Good. Any other comments? Questions? Okay, meetings adjourned. Okay. Good night, all. Thank you for coming.